Buenas tardes para todas y todos. Vamos a comenzar el último. Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to start the last segments of today. We are still waiting for some participants to come in, but we are going to welcome you to this panel session, Risk Reduction Through Sustainable Ecosystem Management, Science and Technology and Nature-Based Solutions. At the eighth regional platform for disaster risk reduction in the Americas and the Caribbean. This session has been organized by the United Nations Devel uh, Environmental Program, as well as the Disaster Risk Reduction Network and the organization, the United Nations for Education and uh, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. Maria Teresa is the moderator. She, over the past 15 years, she has worked in integrated management of coastal areas and adaptation to climate change. She has implemented projects by the uh, by different funds and the Green Climate Fund. Besides, Maria Teresa has moved to Montevideo, Uruguay, from her uh, Venezuela. And I give the floor to the panelists. Thank you very much. Yes, this session on risk reduction, sustainable ecosystem management, science and technology, and nature-based solutions has four objectives. The first one is to provide elements for the orientation of nature-based solutions and their contribution to the protection, preservation, and restoration of terrestrial, marine, and urban ecosystems. Secondly, to provide evidence on the benefits of the implementation of these solutions in terms of the adaptive capacity of ecosystems and livelihoods for communities. Third, to make evident aspects for the articulation of these solutions at the local scale with adaptation strategies at the national level, a more macro level. And finally, to understand the co-benefits of, of implementing these solutions. And for this, we have four extraordinary uh, panelists. Macarena Mo, who's a technical consultant of UNDP. Macarena makes follow-up of the implementation of biodiversity measures and ecosystem in Uruguay. And she conducts the funding strategy for the climate change adaptation plans. Valkyria Esteves from Dominican Republic is the executive director of Aguayaque de Norte Fund. She's an expert in sustainability, comprehensive watershed management governance, environmental dimension of SDGs and risk management, and also provides support for community Groups. Pascal Olivier Giro Pino is the director of the Geography School and professor of the University of Costa Rica. He has done a lot of research on local management of risk adaptation and adaptation to climate change in vulnerable communities, territorial planning, and uh, environmental policy. He has also been the coordinator and advisor of the Ministry of uh, Environment of Costa Rica, as he has also been member of the negotiating team for climate change. Finally, Jorge Ruiz. Jorge is the national coordinator for Guatemala for Wetlands International, and he's currently in charge of the environmental component of nature-based solutions of two World Bank projects. He's also a founding member of the Inter-University Platform for Risk Management of Guatemala. So we invite our audience to make their questions. For those of you in the room, you can enter the code on the screen. And for the online audience, you can go on hopping on the right of your screens. You will find a button, a Slido button, where you can also write your questions. So we will start our conversation with Pascal with quite a comprehensive perspective. What are the necessary elements to build effective and resilient solutions that are based on ecosystems? 
Thank you very much. I believe that the most important thing for us to remember, first of all, is that disasters are not natural. Even though disasters are not natural, nature-based solutions are an a cost-effective option for reducing and mitigating natural hazards. Here on the screen, you will find the definitions that I have found recently on nature-based solutions, which are quite ambitious. But they aim at this uh, multiple goals and the co-benefits that we mentioned at the beginning with relation to the possible co-benefits of uh, nature-based solutions that could provide both to ecosystems and to neighboring communities and uh, cities. In the next slide, you can see some examples of nature-based solutions that comprise ecosystem restoration um, measures for uplands to counter the effects of climate change, also the recharge of aquifers in the uplands of watersheds, everything that has to do with Repopulation uh, measures for mangrove forests, as well as other coastal ecosystem actions, such as the coral reefs. All of this is part of all this set of nature based solutions that provide co benefits for the long term. Some of those co benefits, for example, have to do with reducing the intensity of tides. It has been seen that the repopulation of mangrove forests can significantly reduce the impacts of hurricanes as well as other coastal storms. And finally, there's also the resilience in urban areas where there's increase in temperatures as well as heat waves. Finally, one of the elements that I would like to point out to conclude is this virtuous cycle between having sustainable and healthy ecosystems and a resilient society that's capable of benefiting from those uh, uh, actions, but which is also accountable for sustainable and adaptive uh, initiative for those ecosystems, thus providing protection for those development assets in the long term. Valkyria, what do you think are the elements for building effective solutions? Hello, good afternoon, greetings to all, especially to the panel members who are uh, in the room. Well. Pascal has already mentioned the different elements and nature-based solutions, but an important element is science. Science, the importance of collecting evidence or the importance of data generation in order to be able to build nature-based solutions, the importance of having maps, studies, diagnosis, projections. This information will also enable us to get to know what the current uh, status or state of those ecosystems is, which is critical for reducing risks and increasing resilience. An important aspect in connection with science is to have studies and analysis that show the cost of failure to act but versus the cost of implementing actions with nature-based solutions. Secondly, it's very important to identify risk scenarios, both for the present and for the future, vis-a-vis -vis the different hazards. And based on those scenarios, we should be able to collect important information in order to plan in a comprehensive manner, taking into account 
the five divisions of water security, environmental, economic aspects, but also to plan taken into account social and environmental aspects, i.e. taken into account the different variables at play, resources, accesses, the drivers linked to the risks of the territories, the participation of uh, the government of the different institutions. And finally, we believe that it is very important to develop suitable incentive policies using nature-based solutions such as uh, tax exemptions, process uh, categorization, so that by prioritizing the importance of having information, being able to create risk-based scenarios in order to have systemic planning, in order to have the suitable frameworks and policies that will make it possible for us to promote the effectiveness of nature-based solutions. Thank you very much, Walkiria. Macarena, could you share with us your viewpoint? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Uruguay. I'm going to focus on climate change risks and the adaptation strategies that we have been pushing in Uruguay. I would like to highlight a necessary element that we have been working on for quite some time in Uruguay, which is governance. Governance to plan these solutions and to make them operational. This should happen in an interinstitutional and interdisciplinary framework. The national adaptation plans, well, I'm going to focus on NAP for the coastal uh, area and NAP for cities and infrastructures. This is the one that I'm most familiar with. They were both presented in 2021 and they were developed within an interinstitutional technical committee that was set up within this institutional framework of response to climate change using the guidelines from the National Climate Change Office and as well as guidelines from other agencies such as the Ministry of the Environment which includes territorial planning and uh, housing, as well as other offices. With the cooperation and input of the academia and the subnational governments, of course. Within this framework, we have planned an action plan for NAPs, including activities and uh, measures related to ecosystems, for example, this NAP Cities uh, driver or driving group has been pushing projects that are focused on nature-based solutions, such as the project which we have started to implement this year with uh, the support of UNEP and the uh, Climate Fund. In this way, Ecosystem-based adaptations are built in line with national strategies, such as the National Biodiversity Strategy, which is going to be updated this year, the Urban Drainage Plan, as well as others. The second element of importance, as Walkiria mentioned, is the baseline information on ecosystems ecosystem services, both the existing ones and the potential ones for the reduction of local risks and for adaptation. And for this, we need to create broken down uh, information at the city level or at the city scale. So we have started to work on concrete tools for this. In the second CDN we submitted last year with goals for 2030, it includes actions that are going to um, guide this work. And I'm running out of time, but I could go on if you ask me. Thank you, Macarena. Well, Jorge, uh, to conclude, well, I believe that the necessary elements to be able to build these solutions need to be very specific. I believe that the first one 
should be understanding and helping all the actors to understand how ecosystems work and how they are related to risk. They are also related to disasters and their impact on livelihoods. Based on this, we will be able to understand how a better management of land and water, as well as all the other resources, can increase resilience in communities. Looking at this from two points of view, if we look at it from this point of view, in describing and assessing the resources available to communities, everything that has to do with the goods and services that are supplied to ecosystems, that is a part of the livelihood. The second thing is to understand the role of ecosystems in the risk profiles of communities. A second element, I believe, could be to call, to invite the right actors at all levels so that everyone identifies what they need to do at what time, where, what their responsibilities are from the institutional point of view. The third element could be to have a, a comprehensive approach for development planning. By this, we mean how we can highlight the role of ecosystems in disaster risk reduction programs, as well as climate change adaptation programs by implementing major tools and methodologies that are related to science and technology as well. Number four, I think another important element is that nature-based solutions should be able to help implement processes and tools for planning purposes, for example, municipal development, planning, territorial planning, plans that are important, and that so that they are based on science and technology tools, such as simulation models, which help governments very much have a better idea of what could happen. Finally, I believe that it is important to understand that healthy ecosystems are key for improving the quality of life of people. And we need to understand that if we degrade ecosystems, that's a major threat for people's resilience. So with these five points, we could make some headway, couldn't we? Definitely. So we have spoken about institutional and interinstitutional articulation. We have spoken about scientific data and evidence generation, as well as technical tools. All of this tied to the role of ecosystem that Jorge was just mentioning, everything with a consistent and comprehensive approach for uh, territorial planning. Before I pass on to the next uh, question, I encourage our audience in the room to go to Slido by entering this code that you can see on the screen to write your questions. And for our online audience, you can go on hopping on the button on the right of your screens. You can click there and write your questions. In seeing that articulation is paramount, and I would like to ask Walkiria, what aspects lead to the participation of different sectors in the construction of nature-based solutions? Walkiria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Jorge has encouraged significant participation. We may mention things that have worked for us, taking into account the different actors. How can we achieve this? I'm going, I'm going to mention an example, which is the water funds. As Jorge was saying, this has to do with raising awareness 
we are increasingly faced with countless challenges related to the climate crisis, the water crisis, the social environmental crisis, increase of disasters related to natural phenomena, which jeopardizes life on the planet. But this tells us that it's very important to take care of the planet and ecosystems. Actors need to recognize the existence of this problem and that it affects us all. So the next step of the methodology is to articulate actors in a public, private and civil society partnership around nature-based solutions, either to contribute to water security, adaptation or resilience. So if we manage to articulate these actors to raise awareness around a common goal, we can create active participation, which in turn is going to be reflected in the development of projects and programs that use nature-based solutions in a significant manner. Another important point to lead, to encourage participation, is, as has been mentioned earlier, Nature-based solutions should be seen as uh, cost-effective, as sustainable measures for addressing the climate crisis. There are nature-based solutions where we learn from nature and we learn how nature can manage process in a natural manner. These solutions are more economically viable and the maintenance of this type of solutions is extremely uh, low. It, it doesn't require as much maintenance as conventional solutions. Lastly, we should promote the enablement of regulatory and frameworks as well as policies that will uh, lead to nature-based solutions. Jorge, well, there are many aspects that may lead to the participation of everyone involved in building nature-based solutions. We believe and we trust and we uh, push for education, how we can reach out to the children, to the youth. So besides creating a resilience culture, when we create a resilience culture, we will have, in short, a major participation, which is key. On the other hand, we need to try and have multidisciplinary groups that have a broad uh, landscape of the problems so that they can identify the problems from different perspectives to be able to provide a joint solution. Always with ecosystems at the center to be able to provide better responses. Another important aspect is to engage in dialogues. In Guatemala, we set up the resilience-based dialogues and seminars, inviting many actors, and they were very, very effective. Through those dialogues, through those discussions, we tried to promote nature-based solutions, always taking into account science, practice, and all the other elements and tools that can help us be more efficient in our work. We also need to take into account a broader participation of individuals, not invite all only the ones we like. We should invite everyone so that they can contribute to strengthen capacities and resilience to be able to better withstand each and every disaster that occurs. Finally, the Community-based approaches, which are also based on ecosystems, bring along many side benefits. 
We have seen this already in the projects that we have uh, developed, the restoration of mangrove forests, the restoration of uh, uh, water bodies, bring lots of uh, benefits. And to wrap up, let me say that communication topics are extremely important. How we can ensure the participation by engaging in good communication with people creating the culture of resilience. Yes, without a doubt. Now, Pascali, and I will let Macarena close. Yes, without a doubt, the topic of democratic governance and multi-scale territorial planning are indispensable to be able to implement nature-based solutions. But that uh, brings up a dilemma because they are seen as measures that come from the environmental sectors or that are tied to environmental laws and not as a way of, reduces losses, of reducing losses and damages and creating well-being and benefits for communities. And that's why it's so important to communicate, to educate, to address inclusion as a topic in vulnerable areas and to take effective measures so that the benefits of those nature-based solutions also include those communities that are most vulnerable from also a gender-based uh, approach. Water sources in many communities are impacted by climate change. Many of the risks of climate change are experienced at the local level. So it is important to remember what happened in the latest drought. We are also experiencing a drought with El Nino. So we need to work with local organizations to rebuild the memory and to remember what happened in previous El Nino episodes which is affecting a great portion of Central America and Latin America, leading to more droughts and dry lands. In this sense, nature-based solutions enable to relate actors in the management of disasters. As has already been mentioned earlier, to identify those sustainable livelihoods, linking them to the benefits resulting from a proper management of the ecosystem-based services for the well-being of communities and for territorial security. The reduction of losses and damages is also important. It is uh, foreseen that some of the losses of climate change worldwide could be $800 billion per year if we do nothing. So the cost of failure to act, uh, as mentioned by Waikiria, is extremely important. But we can also say what those direct benefits are that come from restoration and how can we avoid the degradation processes which also uh, lead to migrations and uh, poverty, and we have seen migrations of many people in the region, unfortunately. So in this sense, participation should also be linked to uh, raising awareness and for the building of bridges to be able to prevent those impacts and uh, unfortunate degradations. Thank you, Macarena. Talking about building up capabilities and maybe thinking about stakeholders such as the national level or the national sector and especially those with the, with the natural solutions will sometimes these measures that are based on these environmental aspects and in addition to continue with the different stakeholders I have already mentioned, is how we can share all the information that has been created and to translate it to the daily use tools. Or even how 
it's more about the budget and they need to notice what are the risks and what are the different solutions based in ecosystems and could be more economic and Thus, the focus will be in incorporating the stakeholders and maybe in these major four cities because we are in the middle of the development of that project. So we are also requesting to the subnational governments so to create those groups so they can include technicians or experts in these two directions. So I also wanted to mention something about the private sector. How did we manage to have, for one side, the companies that provide uh, services? We also have uh, some drafts and also in the NAFCOSTARS uh, framework. They have an infrastructure approach, and even in the these references terms also include, and we have noticed that they are also included these uh, ecosystemic resources or understanding, of course, we shouldn't damage the ecosystems. And that is why we have the obligation from those sites to working together and to see how we can have access to the information, understand the information, and understand each other. The financial sector is also another one. We have also created the sustainable tables, and we have gotten a lot of exchange with the environment ministry. And to translate this uh, climate risk to all the risks that are going to be assumed by banks in terms of loans. Also, we also have the productive sector taken into account. So it's how to link the different benefits of the ecosystems. This is another working line that we are including in our agenda. Great. So if we can seek the framework in political and economic and regulatory view, we need to see that it's cost efficient. Education in terms of resiliency, the policy with practical science, information and communication, and also to highlight the innovation for including the private sector as well as the financial sector. Now, having this challenge before us, what do you mean by building up resiliency? Pascal, I would like to start with your remarks. How do you think that these nature-based solutions at the local level can promote the increase of resiliency within the region? Well, resiliency is an aspirational concept because it is difficult to measure and to monitor. However, it is still at the core of all these solutions, solutions based on nature. So we need to link it, and that is by taking advantage of the green infrastructure and trying to restore some of those ecosystems in order to provide services in the long run. I think it is important to bear in mind two things, how with the climate change, the ecosystem will get the impacts. They will lose their capabilities to provide goods and services in the long run. And if we don't have those goods, then that is because we don't have the proper conditions to provide them. I think it is important that Macarena has mentioned in terms of trying to, to talk in all these uh, sectors that many of the countries are also creating these uh, programs to highlight the value of the ecosystems for providing goods and services and how to make it a continuation in a long time. Of course, there are several or plenty links 
between the health of an ecosystem and the well-being of the communities. For instance, for wetlands management and coastlines, and we have also get the a study of the Mesoamerican reef before uh, Guatemala and Belize. So provides a lot of uh, employment, and this is a way to protect their ecosystems. So we can measure that this allows us to reduce losses and damages. And also it could be measured. It is also important to find out some other of these opportunities in order to create synergies and co-benefits within the local area based on the ecosystems that also many of the countries are already following and running in different areas. We have the, the civil advocacy on one side. And we also have the Green Fund adaptation that in many more countries it is already open and, and talked. So we can close these links and work together because those are the two main pillars of one single thing and that is the um, disaster risk management and a climatic adaptation. So what is your input, Margarena? Well, I already imagined that they were going to talk about the ecosystem. So I wanted to point out something that it was already mentioned, and that is to generate this evidence and to have all these cases. I do believe if we try to focus on that sense and we're trying to work with more local solutions, these uh, natural-based solutions, well, we can assess them, measure them, and also create the evidence so we can report the different cases in, in other cities or areas. So by building up these cases is extremely important because it's a very concrete and precise point. So we can start by measuring costs of, of investment and maintenance. We can see that one measure could be more cost benefit than the other. And also what does that mean in terms of uh, natural based solution? So we are talking about the implementation and then the impact of it. Here in Uruguay, as it has been mentioned or presented, and I think at today at five, it will be another presentation about it. We have the climate change project for the ecosystems in Uruguay, and that is for the adaptation fund. And we have uh, different measures that are already implemented. Just to give you an example of it, uh, in terms of natural-based solutions in a greater scale, we have in the Fraiventos city, we are developing, or we are going to build a park where we are going to combine this uh, green infrastructure and different type of infrastructure and there are different actions in protected areas from the those, from the two divisions in Uruguay. So this is another experience that will create this uh, information so it could be mimicked somewhere else. Walkiria, how do you see the development of natural-based solutions at the local level favoring the resiliency for the region? First of all, we need to start thinking that we are all connected and 
We are going to achieve our goal starting from the local level when they recognize that we need to start doing some actions for its adaptation. So solutions are being given at nature. So it will be from the local level and then maybe we can have some other drivers especially for other cities. At the same time, we have a different type of skills and capabilities at the local level. Those could be taken as a model in the region. And I think we also have a different process that we need to walk. And it will be done according to different elements and actions. So. We are heading in the correct direction. However, we just need to be more specific in resiliency. We can increase resiliency at the local level actions in the region by creating these knowledge networks that would allow us to link similar ideas, to have exchanges of ideas, so, for example, we have another project with uh, um, livestock and agriculture, and we also have uh, that with Colombia, so they can see good best practices in a sustainable management of natural resources. So this is just an exchange of practice that would help us to strengthen the, the initiatives in the region. Another important point is the universities. They play an important role in order to ensure that we would have enough professionals where they include all these aspects. I think this is where science at the school level is also so important and for making resiliency more robust. Thank you, Walkiria and Jorge. Just to wrap up the Q&A, well, this is quite interesting because how natural-based solutions can promote or strengthen the resiliency in the region. I also agree that resiliency is not only a concept, but also a capability or a skill. So we need to help to strengthen it from the local level to the national level and then to the regional level. How to strengthen those skills and capabilities? Well, we need to find out all or to find these other projects based on the nature with other communities so we can strengthen these aspects. We can do it by getting different approaches, different focuses from all over the ideas that are being brainstormed. We have the best uh, tools, uh, models, and ideas and concepts. We know we have TNC has a, a tool, WB and W and W has, sorry if I just miss one, but I know that we all of us have different ways to provide input and strengthen the capabilities. Another important point that we need to, to take into account that there is no an, an adaptation strategy. We need to adapt ourselves, and that requires flexibility. Synergy is also important, including these big conventions is also important, so we can all pull to the same direction, not by silos. We really need to create that synergy. The Biodiversity Convention also should be together with everything according to the different agreements, so everything in terms of uh, the Paris Agreement, so Habitat 3. So this is when we can, we will be able to find the different solutions based on the ecosystems. Finally, in our goal or trying to reach these sustainable objectives, we need to notice that the basis of those goals is that natural capital that is providing goods and services to the people. We need to start thinking that from having that 
natural capital in the proper state, having all the ideas in order to meet with the society needs. I will stop there. Okay, so I can sum up the importance of development of local capabilities. That is also very important. And everything by acknowledging all these solutions based on nature and how the academia is joining or getting along with the scientific results for, for robusting knowledge in the decision-making process. So now let's move on to Q&A. In, in this uh, time that we still have left, we have a couple of questions now. The first one, we have identified that governments are difficult to accept this natural-based solution as a, reduc as a strategy for the reduction of disasters. So how do we make it possible? Maybe as a personal experience here in Guatemala, we have already identified many times or frequently, biologists do not have the same idea that conservation is also based on the reduction of these disaster risks. As, as I said to my colleagues, sometimes you don't think about these uh, human resources as shields, protecting shields. So we need to make possible all these dialogues so we can find the different synergies. We also are with the um, National Planning Ministry in Guatemala to see what are these goals. How can we, for instance, for instance, make an introduction of these natural-based solutions that we have proposed. So now, all these municipal development plans have an important component in terms of the natural-based solutions. I do believe that we need to keep acting in different projects with this technical and environmental perspective. Any of you would like to add something or shall we move on to the next question? Walkiria, would you, I would like to hear your perspective because I know that financing is a restricting element in a global element with this limited financing. How do we prevent a silo approach? this segmented approach that has been mentioned several times. Of course, that is for the reduction of uh, disaster risk, but also based on nature. So how do we prevent having this uh, sectorial approach? We need to take into account the important elements for those who are producing these projects. First of all, we need to know and we need to move from theory to the practice. We have the theory based on these natural-based solutions for reducing the risk and for protection of the ecosystems. We also need to prove to the government and different sectors that these solutions are really the ones that are working. And that could be done by making the success of these projects more visible. Another important point is that we need to have an active participation so we can strengthen governance at the local level and at the country level. Another point is the active participation of the schools and universities. This will make possible to have a, a critical path or have a specific plan for having all these projects and programs that make these visible for the final resources. So we, we just strengthen governance, visibility, and good best practices, as well as active participation in order to be successful. Thank you, Walkiria. 
Financial sustainability and making it more cross sectorial and uh, with the natural based solutions is uh, are needed. But instead of having these in, in structural solutions to all these solutions, I think are complementary. If we can convince the construction service that the lifetime of their construction's life cost will be greater if it is combined with some restoring actions, the restoring of this um, uh, of the different uh, possibilities that we could have and we will be in the long run and we can contribute to the reduction of maintenance. So we need to start talking about very precise examples of these solutions that can complement structural approaches for the mitigation. And therefore, they can reduce costs in the long run. I also would like to mention the huge opportunities that we are looking, especially with um, these climate funds as a financial source. Many of the environmental ministries today are getting the greater resources from other organizations due to the Adaptation Fund, the Climate Fund, and many more. This is where we have a more opportunities to work in, in partnerships and look for the different synergies so we can get all these resources combined with the public and those who are international to face sustainability and resiliency and to keep it for the long run. I think this is the way that we need to, to walk. It will be like the carrot that is uh, forcing these two sectors to collaborate for a common good and for getting access to the resources. In the same line as Pascal is saying, we have a, a similar experience. International funds that are linked to climate change are also forcing to that, but it's not a greater effort in some vulnerable areas. We also have the methodology for flooding map risks. We also have We have all these risk elements that are being included, and now we are including the ecosystems, the identification of those ecosystems to the methodology. And this is just because this, it is a requirement due for financing. But it's going to provide benefits for the risk management and adaptation. Just as a more precise example of everything that we are doing that is not difficult to implement in an institutional work, we also have the technical aspects, but the willingness is there and motivation. Yes, motivation is also there. We have a couple of minutes left for another question. I think it's extremely interesting. Jorge, I would like to hear from you according to your experience in wetlands and in the coastline. How can we implement or set these solutions based in nature in different areas where the ecosystem have been damaged or destroyed? This is an interesting question. I think the first thing we need to do is to have this landscape approach, not only see the wet wetland as an isolated ecosystem. We know that this is a part of the ecosystem, part of the reefs, a part of the mountains, so, and everything is connected ecologically speaking. If we see that from the development plan, well, well, we need to make it more compatible on how the natural-based solutions can improve the, the 
living means for the people, fishing practices and many more. We know that nature would be regenerated, so we need to boost that restoring process of nature with this landscape approach and strengthening these means of life as an important part of the work that we are doing in the communities. Well, thank you very much. I would like to mention some conclusions in these four aspects. The first one is by including nature as a solution in the political processes for having these resilient territories and improving our way of life is essential. There's no doubt that there is still some gaps to close in terms of visibility and concepts so we can strengthen the implementation of the natural-based solutions and how these can complement other approaches and other capabilities. And this, of course, has an important impact in the inclusion for the instruments and planning actions as well as other development actions. As a third point, I would like to highlight that easing integration of science and technology by different natural-based solutions is a, the resource for the development of local and national capabilities. This will allow us to explore, among other things, the role of the risk management and how this could be included for uh, these development projects, bigger projects. So that's why we are talking about mobilization of resources. I would like to wrap up with the importance of understanding the benefits of this implementation of solutions based on nature when we have this landscape perspective, as Jorge has mentioned especially for the link of uh, climate change adaptation. So this is about how to get along with the different practices, the public policies, science and technology, to the application of those solutions to reduce the risk of disasters. So we are still working. We are going to keep working in our region to boost resilience uh, construction and to keep developing capabilities and skills to promote sustainable development, and especially to gather and analyze the data, scientific data, in order to inform the decision-making process. It has been a privilege to moderate this session. Thank you very much, Macarena Valkyria from Dominican Republic, Jorge Pascal. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you, the, the people that is here. Thank you for your attention.